تفكر في لحظه حلوه كل شيء سيء في حياتي ذكرته بالسجن يعني هون سقط كثير ضحايا وسقط كثير المساجين قتلوا described by amnesty international as synonymous with death torture, horror, and madness. Tadamor prison in Syria is infamous for its barbaric human rights violations. People used to say, the person who enters is lost and the one who leaves is born. These are 13 prisons worse than death. When people talk about tough prisons in the USA, ADX Florence is usually the first one that comes to mind. It's known as the most secure prison in the country, housing some of the worst criminals ever seen. But few people know there are even places worse than ADX Florence, which have been criticized for their harsh conditions and violation of human rights. In 1992, plans were announced to build a prison on top of a ridge in the Appalachian Mountains in Wise County, Virginia. Many residents were in favor of this decision because it would bring jobs and keep the prison isolated from residential areas. Little did anyone know that Red Onion State Prison would turn out to be one of the most terrible in the country. The Red Onion State Prison was built to be a supermax prison, housing the most dangerous inmates who couldn't be contained in other facilities. Inmates at Red Onion are split between the general population and segregation. No matter which group they're in, they spend most of their day in small cells that are set up so they can't see each other. Life in the general population at Red Onion is tough, even tougher than at regular maximum security prisons. They have limited movement, social interaction, access to programs, and freedom to make choices. But compared to the inmates in segregation, general population inmates have it easy. Segregated inmates at Red Onion live in conditions meant to keep them isolated and cut off from the outside world. They eat within their cells, with their food being pushed through a slot in the door. They can leave their cells to shower three times a week, and they just get one hour of recreation outside for five days a week. And every time an inmate in segregation gets to leave his cell, they have to go through some intense security measures. First, they get strip searched, then handcuffed, and shackles are put on the legs, and finally a belly chain's attached. Two officers escort the inmate to recreation, the shower, or wherever he needs to go, with one holding the chain and another holding this electronic stun device against the inmate's body. But that's not all for these inmates, because being socially isolated in a small space can be tough on a person, both physically and mentally. It can be destructive if it goes on for a long time. You see, prolonged isolation can cause symptoms that are usually seen in people with severe mental disorders, like hallucinations, delusions, and panic attacks. I feel like I've been buried alive in the ground and just everybody's just basically walking over top of you. You can hear them, but they can't hear you. That's the way I feel, forgotten. In 2021, a report by The Appeal talked about Tyquin Lee, who got sentenced to 78 years in prison for a string of home invasions in 2011 with his girlfriend. He spent over 600 days in solitary confinement at Red Onion between 2016 and 18, and he barely survived them. When his mom, Takesha Brown, finally got to see him through the plexiglass after that 12-hour trip, she was shocked. She said, His bones stuck out. His teeth were decaying. His clothes were filthy? It's horrifying. I'll remember this sight for the rest of my life. According to reports, Lee was sometimes given food that was covered in maggots and dirt, and he would lose over 30 pounds. Both mental and physical health got so bad for him that he started speaking in numbers and signing his name with random letters. Takesha was appalled by her son's condition, and it pained her to have to leave him there, exposed to such conditions. She said again, Before we left, Ty Quinn would start to growl and bark like a dog. And the worst thing here is that Ty Quinn Lee isn't just the only inmate at Red Onion who's been affected by these awful conditions. Both Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have spoken out about the inhumane conditions at this prison. They pointed out that Red Onion has the highest rate of solitary confinement in Virginia, and almost 200 inmates in segregation have been diagnosed with mental illness. Some say that being isolated is what pushed them to this point especially since they never received medical treatment for it. In 2012, inmates at Red Onion went on this hunger strike to shed light on the abuse of conditions. One prisoner would describe the horrors they faced, saying, Having your fingers broken inside this place, being bitten by dogs, being strapped to beds for days, as we've talked about many times, being forced to defecate on yourself. I mean, all this has led to these men demanding to be treated as human beings. It's like if you're put inside a prison, you forfeit the 
the right to be treated as a human being. During the strike, the inmates made 10 simple demands, including better food, easier access to complaint forms, and proper medical care. But it looks like those demands fell on deaf ears. January 2024, more inmates at Red Onion started another hunger strike for the same reasons. Their goal was again to shed light on the claimed mistreatment they would face at the hands of the guards, particularly when they try to submit complaint forms. And well, it's hard to say when or if these conditions will ever change. 1899. After the closure and demolition of the infamous Grand Roquette Prison, convicts were transferred to a new one called La Santé, which ironically translates to good health. However, this name starkly contrasts with the reality faced by prisoners behind these walls. Initially, inmates were sent to La Santé to await execution, similar to how it was done at Grand Roquette. Criminals, resistance fighters from the German occupation of France, and possibly innocent people were guillotined at this very prison. But these prison walls would witness things even more terrifying than that. Over the years, the prison gained notoriety for being located in the heart of Paris just steps away from a primary school. The sounds of children playing mixed with the cries of prisoners created a really strange atmosphere in the area. La Santé also became known for the infamous inmates it housed, such as Jacques Mezrin, a killer who never met a prison he couldn't break out of, including La Santé and Michel Vajou, a robber whose wife once flew a chopper into a courtyard to help him escape. In 2000, La Santé attracted even greater attention because of the shocking conditions that revealed a harsh truth about French prisons. This would happen after a French doctor named Véronique Vasseur dropped a bombshell by publishing a book about her time as a chef medical officer at La Santé. She said everything that happened the past seven years she spent there, and let me tell you, sounded like a nightmare. Skin disease was running wild around here because showers were only available twice a week, even though temperatures sometimes reached over 100 degrees in these cramped cells, holding four prisoners each. Inmates would also stuff their clothes in the cracks of their cells to keep the rats out, and most of the mattresses were infested with lice and other bugs. The food was often spoiled, leading to frequent outbreaks of gastroenteritis. And these inmates would have wounds, trench foot, and other skin infections that were usually only seen at wartime. Readers were shocked. Le Santé was like a city within a city, with its own rules and morality governed by violence and illogical practices. Drug dealing was uncontrollable, with some guards even getting involved here. Self-mutilations, suicide, and attempted suicide were also alarmingly frequent. We would have the guards beat up prisoners, and seasoned inmates would turn weaker ones into slaves who were too scared to speak up. This book caused a stir all around the country and led to investigations by the press, Le Monde, to conduct its own investigations and publish reports on the cases of mistreatment, suicide, negligence, and rape that would take place within La Santé's walls and would conclude that the prison had been abandoned by French authorities to disease and death. In 2013, lawyer Etienne Noel a well-known advocate for prisoners' rights in France, raised concerns about the cramped conditions at La Santé prison. His reports revealed that each prisoner had a mere two square meters of personal space. The maximum security cells were even more suffocating, resembling tight boxes where one could almost touch both walls with outstretched arms. In 2014, finally, the authorities relented and closed La Santé prison for renovations. It reopened again in 2019 with a reduced capacity of 800 prisoners. However, there's little optimism among the public regarding the improvement of conditions. French politicians continue to express discontent as the French prison system fails to meet European standards. Overcrowding continues to be a critical problem, surpassing 200%, and many inmates lack even the most basic essentials, like a bed to sleep in. If we have fans of Prison Break here, you'll remember how intense Sona Prison was. Shockingly, there are real-life prisons just as brutal. Sabaneta Prison in Venezuela is one of them. Like many Venezuelan prisons, Sabaneta was severely overcrowded, with limited access to food, water, and medical care. Especially those in Venezuela are famous for their overcrowding and for the way they're run. Guards watch the gate, but largely leave the inmates inside. 
In 1958, it was originally built to house 700 inmates. By the time it closed in 2013, it held over 3,700. Sabaneta Prison operated as a lawless environment, where inmates had complete control. This would lead to harsh conditions with little oversight from authorities, creating a survival of the fittest atmosphere that sometimes turned catastrophic. January 3, 1994, a riot erupted due to ongoing gang conflicts. Inmates started a fire and a attacked others trying to escape, resulting in many casualties and injuries. Security forces trying to regain control caused more deaths, with reports of over 150 casualties in total. After that, Human Rights Watch visited several Venezuelan prisons, including Sabaneta, and the things they saw there were incredibly disturbing. Their report highlighted the severe issue with overcrowding in Venezuelan prisons, which lead to drastic outcomes. The most tragic of them is the loss of life. With about four prisoners killed and over 20 injured weekly, the prevalence of weapons, from knives to grenades, contributes to the violence within these prisons. During a visit to Sabaneta, it was pretty shocking to see prisoners openly displaying weapons like machetes and homemade firearms. And as expected, in such a harsh environment, a lot of inmates take advantage of each other for their own gain. The mantra, only the strong survive, was a common sentiment among prisoners there. The powerful prisoners live comfortably, making money off of others, and have weaker inmates do their bidding. So on the other hand, the weakest endure the worst conditions, sleeping on crowded floors, cleaning other cells, and facing mistreatment and sexual abuse. Some prisoners try to escape this dangerous environment by forming groups known as refugees. These groups consist of vulnerable prisoners who seek shelter in unused areas of the prison, away from the general population. And now you're probably wondering, where are the guards? Well, they only have one guard for every 150 or more prisoners. And sometimes, there are no guards at all. As the report dug deeper, they found that violence was just the tip of the iceberg. Inmates didn't have basic medical supplies here because no medical staff was allowed in the prison. You'd see inmates display exposed intestines or festering wounds and they couldn't even get treatment. The Venezuelan government said they'd make things better after this report, but nothing really changed and conditions inside Sabaneta kept getting worse. 2013, after a riot that killed 16 inmates, making the death toll that year alone reach 70, the government had to close Sabaneta prison. But that's like pulling out a single tooth from an entirely decayed mouth. Human rights groups say that to this day, Venezuelan prisons remain extremely harsh and dangerous. 1920, Caranjudu Penitentiary opened its doors for the first time in Sao Paulo, becoming the largest prison in South America at the time. Now, initially, it was designed to hold 3,500 inmates, but it quickly became overcrowded, eventually housing over 8,000 prisoners. Now, this led to harsh living conditions and extreme overcrowding. And because of this, many prisoners slept on the floor of their cells, sometimes in the bathroom next to the hole that serves as a toilet. They were forced to provide their own mattresses, bedding, clothing, and toiletries. In 2002, the prison was finally demolished and transformed into a museum. Why? Well, this place is where one of the worst prison tragedies went down. A fight breaks out between two groups after a football game escalating into a full-blown riot that lasted three hours. During the chaos, prisoners attacked each other with knives and pipes, overpowering the guards. The prison director called the local military police for help, leading to a violent incursion of over 340 officers into this prison complex. The riot resulted in the deaths of 111 inmates. The officers defended their actions by claiming that they were met with armed resistance from the prisoners, who also attempted to infect them with HIV. Amnesty International looked into that situation and found over 3,000 bullets were fired during that incident, with over 500 of them ending up in the bodies of deceased prisoners. They would find many dead bodies with their hands in front of their faces or behind their heads, indicating that they were in defensive positions. And interestingly, all the policemen left that prison without a single scratch. Following the incident, the prisoners at Karanjiru continued to riot, in protest of the lack of accountability for the massacre and the harsh living conditions they endured. In 2002, the government shut down that prison in this attempt to put an end to the unrest they were causing. However, closing that prison didn't solve issues within the Brazilian prison system, which has been criticized as medieval by Jose Eduardo Cardozo, 
the former Attorney General of Brazil. The prison population has more than doubled in recent years and continues to increase, while the system is struggling to keep up with the increasing number of detainees, and many fear that the system is on the brink of collapse. Bang Quang Central is a men's maximum security prison in Nathaburi Province, Thailand. Now, Bang Quang is the site of the men's death row and the main execution chamber in Thailand. The prison is known as the Bangkok Hilton because it houses many foreign prisoners. Yet, once inside, you'll find that the inmates give it an entirely different name, Big Tiger, because it prowls and eats pieces of them every single day. Let's put it this way. A lot of the people in here will never see free air again. One of the foreign prisoners held at Bang Quang was John Davies, a British national, who was convicted of trying to sell a large amount of heroin to a police informer in Thailand. Davies was initially sentenced to death, but it was later reduced to 25 years. He finally returned to the UK after spending 17 years in that place he called a hellhole. In many interviews, he spoke about the conditions the prisoners had to live through. Prisoners in Bang Quang were required to wear leg irons for the first three months of their sentences. Death row inmates had to have their leg irons permanently welded on. Well, that practice ended in 2013 after many human rights organizations argued that this was just brutal, unnecessary, and inhumane. And because of this, Davies had an infection which almost led to his foot being amputated. Davies' interview was the first time someone shed light on what happens in Bang Quang, or Thai prisons in general. The UN Human Rights Council issued a report detailing the brutal conditions of Thai prisons, including Bang Quang. At its peak, this prison and housed over 8,000 inmates, causing insane crowding. And because of that, prisoners were forced to sleep on their sides due to insufficient space and in order to avoid conflicts with other inmates. These inmates reported experiencing back and leg pain because they couldn't move while they slept. Reports say that there are four fluorescent lights that are kept on throughout the night because of the fear of prisoners escaping, which affects the inmates sleeping and makes them irritable and more prone to lashing out and hurting each other. Prisoners don't have an adequate supply of water for personal hygiene. They said that water was available in the mornings between 5.30 a.m. and 7. This small window for bathing was stressful, as around 50 to 70 prisoners used that area at the same time. One inmate said, if you don't fight, you don't get a space in the shower before the water has run out. The water isn't the only thing scarce in this prison. Inmates lack adequate food, which results in malnourishment. The food is just unclean and inedible. One inmate said, When eating, you have to be careful because sometimes there are stones and sand in the food. Inmates also lack access to medical treatment. Another inmate said, The first thing I was told when I got there was that I must not get sick because if I got sick, I'd be better off dead. And while procedures for making a complaint exists, inmates are afraid of retaliation at the hands of prison authorities because they usually get beaten up or punished in solitary confinement. Nowadays, to improve this situation, authorities reduce the number of prisoners in Bang Quang to 3,800. It's still beyond capacity, but it's definitely an improvement. Now, whether these conditions will continue to improve. Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, is known for being one of the cleanest and most organized cities in Africa. But it's a far cry from the chaos that followed the genocide in 1994, where an estimated 1 million people lost their lives. Nowadays, Kigali has very few street children and beggars, and you won't see a lot of prostitutes hanging around either. Street vendors are always on their toes, ready to pack up and move at a moment's notice if the police show up. But as they say, all that glitters is not gold. The reason behind Kigali's pristine image isn't as rosy as it seems. The Rwanda National Police have a habit of rounding up people they deem undesirable and tossing them into Gagando Transit Center, an unofficial detention facility in a residential area of Kigali. There, detainees are subjected to all sorts of human rights violations before being released back onto the streets, often with orders to leave the city. A recent report by Human Rights Watch exposed the harsh reality of living inside Gagando Transit Center. <laughs> Former detainees recounted being crammed into rooms with hundreds of others, enduring beatings and inhumane treatment. Some were held for days, others for months, all without being charged or given a fair trial. And the conditions in this detention center are beyond terrible. <laughs> Because I'm the one who's in the middle of the world.
The people inside here are abused by police or other detainees, sometimes just for speaking too loudly or not standing in line to use the toilet. These poor people were also denied basic necessities like food, water, and proper sleeping arrangements. They were crammed into tight spaces and forced to sleep on the floor, often without a mattress. And when mattresses were provided, it was with lice and fleas and shared among multiple detainees. The sanitation was terrible. People here had to use an open trench as a toilet. <laughs> Now, despite being labeled as a rehabilitation center, Kakondo lacked proper medical treatment and support for these detainees. Visitors, like lawyers, were rarely allowed in, leaving detainees without legal assistance. But the most disturbing finding of them all was the high number of children at this center. The report showed that over 2,800 children were living in the streets of Rwanda, with almost half of them being placed in centers like Kakondo. These children faced the same harsh conditions as the adults. One boy described being beaten by clubs and was told that as long as they lived on the streets, they would be punished. One former detainee, a 40-year-old woman, shared her experience of being taken to Kagando for the very first time. She said that when she got there, there was what the guards referred to as a welcome party. <laughs> She described the brutal treatment they received, with street children being beaten first, followed by women being beaten on their feet, and men being forced to lie on their bellies and endure beatings on their buttocks by the police. Even months later, she still felt the physical and emotional pain from those beatings. And according to Human Rights Watch, there are approximately four detention centers like Gagondo scattered across Rwanda, with the possibility of even more existing. It's a troubling reality that these centers are still in operation today. Kamiti is a maximum security prison located in Nairobi, Kenya. Back in the 1980s and early 90s, the prison was home to many political prisoners and witnessed many executions. It's notorious for poor conditions and inhumane treatment, especially since it houses some of Kenya's most dangerous criminals. Overcrowding, inadequate diet, lack of clean water, unsanitary conditions, and diseases have long played committee. Former inmate Eddie Kuria shared his experience at Kamiti, describing the lack of medical care, proper sanitation, and the high mortality rate amongst inmates. Unfortunately, deaths in Kenyan prisons are not uncommon. According to Amnesty International, over 2,700 people have died in this prison in recent years. Korea also mentioned the lack of nutritious food and clean water at Kamiti, forcing prisoners to use the drainage water for bathing. The cramped cells, with more than 15 inmates squeezed into small rooms, also contribute to the spread of diseases and instances of sexual abuse. In 2009, a cholera outbreak claimed the lives of many prisoners at Kamiti. And to top it off, torture and ill treatment are unfortunately common occurrences here. On November 17, 2008, there was a search for a mobile phone in the prison. The wardens ended up brutally beating someone, and the whole thing was caught on camera. The video was given to the Kenyan National Commission on Human Rights. The Kenyan government has been saying that conditions in their prisons have gotten better in recent years, but it seems like that might not be the case. January 2022, inmates discovered that their already meager food rations had been reduced. And on top of that, they were put on lockdown because three inmates managed to escape. The inmates weren't too happy about these new conditions, so they protested. Unfortunately, over 20 of them would end up getting beaten badly by officers, and some of them barely made it out alive. Constructed in the 1940s under Spanish colonial rule, Black Beach Prison in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea, has a dark history of cruelty and harsh conditions. In this interview with E.G. Justice, an equato ghanaian human rights organization, activist Joaquin Eloayedo described his time in the prison as pure hell. He recounted a horrific incident where nine boys died from diarrhea, left abandoned with one of them passing away right outside his cell. Despite the tragedy, the other inmates 
inmates carried on with their daily routines, unfazed by the lifeless body lying nearby. Ayedo shared that life in Black Beach strips away any sense of humanity. The constant brutality and lack of compassion desensitizes everyone who spends time there. The lack of concern for human life was clear when it took three hours for someone to remove the deceased boy's body. Even after two weeks, no authorities bothered to investigate. Instead, the jail administrator callously repeated, He who dies will be taken out. As a warning to the other prisoners, Ayedo pointed out how many people are in a preventative detention at Black Beach. These individuals were held without a fair trial, conviction, or formal charges. Out of 800 prisoners during Ayedo's 12-month stay, only 300 have been convicted of a crime. At Black Beach, there are only two public toilets with 16 taps, and sadly, only four of them work. And you can imagine that leads to constant fighting amongst the prisoners. To make matters worse here, the toilets don't even have running water. Each inmate only gets between 10 and 15 liters of water per day, and the food is pretty awful, causing frequent outbreaks of diarrhea that end up killing some prisoners. There are no beds or mattresses, just whatever cardboard scraps prisoners can find. And if that's not enough, the metal mesh that was supposed to separate the floors is more of a battleground for hundreds of prisoners fighting for a spot to sleep there. As nobody wants to be the one to die a painful death if the wires give in and everyone falls and crushes the prisoners below, Ayedo isn't the only one who survived Black Beach Prison and lived to tell the tale. From December 2013 to August 2015, South African Danielle Jans van Rensburg was locked up at Black Beach for fraud and theft charges he claimed were false. In his book, he shared a traumatizing moment when he heard his friend's name called for execution. He had to witness as his friend and six others were handcuffed, handed over to soldiers, and taken up to the hill to face the firing squad awaiting him. Later on, he discovered that the men didn't die easily due to the incompetence of the firing squad. They were untrained, overexcited, and a few were even drunk. To confirm their deaths, a few of them had to be shot directly in the head. Despite calls from human rights groups for change in Equatorial Guinea prisons, especially Black Beach, they haven't changed anything. Black Dolphin Prison, one of Russia's most infamous and toughest correctional facilities, is situated near the Kazakhstan border. The prison got its name from the statue located at the entrance, which was actually crafted by the inmates themselves. This max security prison houses some of the country's most dangerous criminals, like serial killers, terrorists, and even cannibals. Due to the high-risk nature of its inmates, Black Dolphin is renowned for its top-notch security measures, ensuring that no one ever makes it out of there alive. With around 700 people in here, the prison has a chilling history of violence, with inmates collectively responsible for over 3,500 deaths. That's an average of five murders per prisoner. Inmates are confined to cramped 50 square foot cells, shared with another prisoner, secured behind three sets of steel doors, they're granted only 90 minutes of daily exercise in a separate small cell, during which their own cells are thoroughly searched for contraband. Under 24-hour surveillance, inmates are forced to stand and are forbidden from resting or sitting on their bunks from the time they awake until bedtime, which is roughly 16 hours, and they must respond to commands with a curt yes sir. Guards conduct regular checks every 15 minutes to ensure compliance with prison rules. Meals consist of nothing but soup and bread served four times a day in their cells, and access to entertainment is severely limited, with only a few books, newspapers, and a radio available. Upon arrival, inmates are blindfolded to prevent them from memorizing the layout of the prison or planning escapes. They would blindfold inmates to even transfer them between buildings and rooms. The Black Dolphin prison officers also have a unique way of escorting inmates. Prisoners are kept bent over at the waist, while a guard holds their handcuffed hands behind their back, higher than the hips. This control tactic prevents the inmate from escaping or attacking prison staff. Now, the staff are trained to show no sympathy and treat prisoners as if they weren't human beings. Lieutenant Dennis Avsyuk, who oversees the prison, mentioned that the inmates have committed serious crimes, like murder, as well as being maniacs, pedophiles, and terrorists. In this interview with National Geographic, Mr. Avsyuk said, 
To call him people, it makes your tongue bend back just to say it. I've never felt any sympathy for him. He also noted that the only way to escape Black Dolphin is by dying, as inmates are imprisoned here for life. One inmate, Nikolai Ostankov, serving a life sentence for killing an entire family and burning their bodies in the forest, would say that dwelling on his fate in Black Dolphin wasn't worth it. He stated, If you constantly think about how you are here, what is waiting for you, that you won't ever get free, that you are left here alone. The goal is to burst and break down. You simply won't make it. Another notable inmate, Vladimir Nikolaev, known for cannibalism, is serving time in Black Dolphin for his gruesome crime. He killed a man during a drunken fight, then dismembered him in the bathroom. I mean, it's understandable that a facility housing such dangerous individuals must be secure. But are the conditions in Black Dolphin too harsh and cruel? What do you guys think? 1980. The Turkish Ministry of Justice established Diyarbakir as a medium security prison. However, after a coup d'etat that took place in the country that same year, the prison was transferred to military administration and became a martial law max security military prison. In 1989, when Turkey found democracy again, the prison was handed back to the Ministry of Justice. Regrettably, Diyarbakir had already earned a notorious reputation as the slaughterhouse of Turkey, with widespread incidents of brutal mistreatment and human rights abuse, more specifically against Kurdish political detainees. Now, this dark period was often referred to as the period of barbarity, or the hell of Diyarbakir. Following the coup, tens of thousands of individuals, mostly Kurdish, were arrested, with many ending up in this prison. Amnesty International received a lot of reports of torture, including accounts of over a hundred deaths because of torture. And to add to this, speaking any language other than Turkish was prohibited, even during visits, and the Kurds felt they were being Turkified. Inmates were also required to memorize the Turkish national anthem and other nationalist songs. The methods used for torture within Diyarbakir were horrifying and showed a level of unprecedented barbarity. Common practices would include severe beatings, hair pulling, saluting a guard's dog, trained to bite the prisoner's genitals, prolonged deprivation of sleep, food and water, as well as Palestinian hangings, a method that was common in Israel prisons, where prisoners were hung by their arms. Additionally, they would be subjected to electric shocks, mock executions, and other forms of intense physical and psychological stress. Mehdi Zana, the former mayor of Diyarbakir, who spent 11 years in the prison, vividly describes the harsh welcome new prisoners received. Upon arrival, the captain would order a guard to prepare a bath for the prisoner before taking him to the dormitory. This brutal ritual involved nearly 20 guards accompanying the prisoner, who would then be subjected to this violent thrashing before being left unconscious in a bathtub full of feces for hours. Businessman Salim Dindar, a former inmate at Diyarbakir, also said, Before our detention, we thought that torture was applied during interrogation and that the wards in prison were comfortable. But in Diyarbakir prison, we longed for the torture chambers of interrogation. The unsanitary conditions and torture led to the deaths of over 300 people, with some dying during hunger strikes, others shot while allegedly trying to escape, and many more just taking their own lives. May 18, 1982. Four young prisoners made a powerful statement by setting themselves on fire in protest, becoming martyrs of freedom in Kurdish collective memory. On October 24, 2022, President Erdogan announced that the prison would be permanently closed and would be turned into a museum, finally putting an end to Diyarbakir's long history of injustice and suffering. One of the most notorious prisons for women in Afghanistan is Badambagh in Kabul. The females here would endure harsh treatment and are frequently imprisoned for so-called moral crimes, like fleeing abusive homes or interacting with men who aren't relatives. In 2014, Kawun Kamush, a journalist from the BBC, visited the prison. He had a chance to meet some of these women, listen to their stories, and witness the conditions they were living in. Kamush discovered that many of the women were locked up without ever seeing a courtroom, and some were being held without being convicted for up to two years. On top of that, the prison accommodates convicted drug traffickers, murderers, and of course women accused of moral crimes, resulting in a tense atmosphere, as they're all confined in cramped conditions. There are approximately two dozen small rooms spread across three floors, with around ten women sharing each room. During his visit, Kamush met a young girl, named 
named Kabela, who had been imprisoned for traveling from Badakhshan to Kabul with a young boy. Her teeth were damaged and her right hand was injured. She explained, I broke my teeth and injured my hand because I fight with anyone, with my roommates, officers, and guards. To add to this, numerous children are held within this prison with their mothers, facing inadequate resources and unsanitary conditions. One woman serving 14 years here was worried about her child growing up in confinement and questioning why they were deprived of their freedom. She expressed her fear, saying, they will be young boys and girls when I'm released, and I know they will ask me what crimes they committed. Back in the day, things were already pretty tough for those women, but ever since the Taliban took over in August 2021, it's been a total nightmare. Now women are banned from secondary and university education, work with government or non-government organizations, or traveling long distances with a male relative. They can't even go to gyms or public parks. <laughs> And if a woman breaks any of these rules, she could end up in prison under terrible conditions. Now, before the Taliban took over, women who were survivors of gender-based violence had access to free legal help, shelter, medical care, and counseling. But now the Taliban has gotten rid of all of that, and any woman who tries to leave an abusive situation could end up in prison. And to make matters worse, women in prisons all over the country, like Badam Bagh, are facing horrible abuse and torture. Earlier this year, The Guardian got a video showing a female Afghan human rights activist being sexually assaulted and tortured by two Taliban men while in prison. She said she was arrested for protesting against the Taliban and was raped while locked up. She since left Afghanistan, but when she spoke out against the Taliban from exile, they sent her the video and threatened to share it with her family and on social media if she kept criticizing them. She thinks they recorded the attack on purpose to silence and shamer. Unfortunately, hers wasn't the only case The Guardian wrote about in their report. In one case, a woman's body was found in a canal, weeks after being taken into custody by Taliban militants. They sexually abused her before they killed her. November 2022. Zarifa Yakubi, an Afghan activist, was also imprisoned for 40 days for trying to organize a movement for Afghan women. She said that while she was in there, she got electric shocks and a lot of physical abuse. Zarifa was ultimately forced to confess to accepting money from foreigners to protest against the Taliban. Another activist, Parwana Nejarabi, shared her harrowing experience of being beaten and tortured with electric shocks by the Taliban after protesting for women's rights in the same year. She spent the month in solitary confinement and was shown a letter with an order for her to be stoned to death. Nejarabi eventually confessed under duress and fled Afghanistan to live in exile. Despite the dangers they face, brave women in Afghanistan protest and speak out against the Taliban regime. Over the past two years in this country, there have been at least 221 acts of protest by women and girls. When we hear North Korea, we probably already imagine a horrible prison, right? Well, let me tell you about Keichan Internment Camp, also known as Camp 14. It might just be the worst thing you can possibly imagine. Camp 14 is a concentration camp in central North Korea, covering about 155 square kilometers. It's filled with farms, mines, and factories nestled in the steep mountain valleys. Inside this camp, there are overcrowded barracks where men, women, and children are kept separately. There's an HQ with administrative buildings and guard housing. Around 15,000 people are imprisoned in Camp 14. Those sent to the camp include officials who are seen as underperforming, critics of the regime, their children, people born in the camp, and those suspected of any kind of anti-government activity. Some prisoners are even victims of the regime's three generations of punishment rule, where three generations of a family are sent to the camp and may die there without having committed any crimes themselves. Holy shit. But why would a prison have mines and farms, you ask? Well, the main goal of this camp is to isolate individuals deemed politically unreliable by the North Korean government and to exploit their labor. In this camp, prisoners are put to work in the coal mines, agriculture, or factories, producing various goods like textiles, paper, food, rubber, shoes, ceramics, and cement. However, this forced labor isn't meant to help them rehabilitate. 
It's just a way to get some profit. Now, reports say that the prisoners of this camp have to work long hours, sometimes from 5.30 in the morning until midnight, and they don't get any rewards for their hard work. Their food rations are meager at best, like salted cabbage and corn, and as a result, they become malnourished, losing teeth and having blackened gums. Many prisoners end up dying from malnutrition illness, work accidents, or torture. Some are so desperate to eat something that they eat some frogs, insects, rats, snakes, and sometimes even resort to cannibalism. That's why many dream of working on the farms. It at least gives them a chance to steal some animal food and maybe search through animal droppings for undigested grains. But if a prisoner is caught eating anything other than their rations, they are shot on the spot. So this brings us to the 10 rules that prisoners have to follow at all times. Guys, when you hear this, you're gonna think it's straight out of an Orwell novel. One, you must not escape. Two, three or more inmates must not meet together. Three, you must not steal. Four, you must absolutely obey the orders of the protection agency guidance officers. Five, you must immediately report if you see any outsiders or suspicious people. Six, all inmates must carefully watch over each other and immediately report each other's unusual behavior. Seven, you must over-fulfill your tasks assigned to you. Eight, unless it's job-related, no contact between male and female is allowed. Nine, you must be truly remorseful for your own mistakes. And 10, you shall be immediately shot by the firing squad if you ever violate these laws and regulations of the camp. Now this place has harsher special jails within the camp where food is even more scarce and people are often beaten to death. Nearby, there are also less strict camps though where prisoners might have a shot at freedom, even if it is a long shot. But for those in Camp 14, there's no way out and no peace after death because when they pass away, they're wrapped in matting and buried in unmarked graves so nobody can find or grieve for them. 2001. Amnesty International releases a report about Tadmor Prison in Syria, shedding light on this unimaginable horror happening within its walls. The report described the prison as a place synonymous with suffering. Located in the scorching deserts of eastern Syria, Tadmor Prison was originally built as a military barracks by the French Mandate Forces. However, it gained notoriety in the 80s for its extreme brutality, human rights abuses, and mass executions. June 27, 1989. The day after Hafez al-Assad, the then president of Syria, survived a failed assassination attempt, a tragic event unfolded at Tadmor. Members of the defense brigades, led by Rifat al-Assad, the president's brother, stormed the prison at dawn and ruthlessly killed an estimated thousand prisoners. The massacre was believed to be a retaliation for the assassination attempt, which was allegedly orchestrated by the Syrian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. However, the brutality at Tadmor wouldn't stop here. Former detainees of Tadmor prison have shared harrowing stories of torture methods that led to the deaths of thousands of prisoners. Some of these were so extreme and unprecedented that they had never been seen anywhere else in the world. Jailers at Tadmor had free reign to kill prisoners during torture sessions, with prison management even encouraging their participation in these acts of brutality. The methods would include brutal beatings with electric cables and whips, electrocution in general, and the horrifying practice of throwing prisoners from heights until their bones shattered. With their military boots and rifle butts, the inmates suffered bone and skull fractures. Now, Among the uniquely Syrian methods of torture was the infamous flying carpet technique. This involved binding the prisoner to a flat board, rendering them completely immobile, and subjecting them to relentless beatings and other forms of physical abuse while in this helpless position. Not only were prisoners subjected to physical torture, but would also endure emotional torment. This included constant verbal abuse, not being allowed to see their jailers and tormentors, being forbidden to communicate with other prisoners, and being forced to kneel and bow to the photo of Al-Assad. These methods were designed to strip prisoners of their dignity and push them to the edge of insanity. Syrian poet Faraj Bavraktar once remarked, We used to distinguish guards from the color of their boots, since we were never allowed to see their faces or make eye contact. Anyone who dared to do so was killed. Another former prisoner wrote in a memoir smuggled out of Syria, When death is a daily occurrence, lurking in torture, random beatings, eye gouging, broken limbs and crushed fingers, 
Wouldn't you welcome the merciful release of a bullet? Former inmates often share stories about their first hours at Tadmore and the infamous reception party, a brutal session of torture that new prisoners were subjected to upon arrival. A former detainee recounted to Amnesty how they were pulled off the bus by wardens who were mercilessly whipping them until they were all out. The military police then searched their clothes before stuffing them into a car tire with their hands touching their feet. Then they would beat them between two and four hundred times on their feet while they were completely defenseless. By the end, everyone was in bad shape, with bleeding legs and wounds all over their body. Tragically, many prisoners don't even survive the reception party. The military officers at Tadmore were always coming up with new ways to degrade and torture these prisoners. Sometimes it seemed like they just did it for fun. For example, one inmate described a night when a guard ordered him to move all the slippers in the dormitory, about a hundred pairs actually, using only his mouth. He had to keep doing this all night long. This other time involved two other prisoners who were forced to hold another inmate by his hands and feet, lift him high in the air, and then throw him to the ground. When one prisoner refused, they beat the crap out of him and he died a month later. On top of all of this, the prison itself is a breeding ground for disease, with inmates succumbing to cholera, tuberculosis, and scabies in large numbers. Now, despite desperate pleas for medical help for dying prisoners, the guard's response was always the same. Only call us to collect bodies. 2001. Todmore Prison was shut down and everybody in here was moved to other prisons around Syria. However, on June 15, 2011, the prison was reopened after the Syrian revolution against Bashar al-Assad's regime, and thousands of detainees were sent there for questioning and torture. May 2015, Todd Moore was taken over by the terrorist group ISIS, who used explosives to completely destroy this prison. Before blowing it up, they shared pictures of the inside. Besides the guards and detainees who survived, no one had ever seen inside its walls before. The destruction of this building was a surprise to many, who wanted it to remain as a reminder of the years of cruelty. And getting rid of this prison didn't really put an end to the oppression. Since 2011, thousands of Syrians have been held captive, enduring unspeakable horrors in these prisons that continue the legacy of Tadamor to this day, such as the notorious Seydnaya, also known as Syria's Slaughterhouse. <laughs> Thank you.